Coming to you from the greatest city in the world, this is the number one showbiz podcast. It's Talk for Two. Here's your host, Matt Bailey. Thank you, Gary. And thanks to our season sponsors, Axtel Expressions and the Tangent Bat Network. Go, go, go. Check them out. We love them. You know we talk about them every single week. And today is beyond epic. Five-time Grammy winner, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. Today, we talk with founding member of the police, Mr. Stuart Copeland. He's bringing his show Off the Score to Lower Manhattan this Friday night, April 8th at 7.30 p.m. In addition to his rock history, he's actually an awesome composer, and this show features John Kimura Parker and three other musicians. The quintet will present a conglomeration of classical and original orchestrations, and of course, rock and roll. To get tickets to Off the Score, go to stuartcopeland.com. And if you're a Pace University student, you can visit the Schimmel Center box office for $10 tickets in person, but you got to go to the box office. In addition to discussing this unique show, we talk about his love for YouTube, why he's excited to play in New York City, and the fun he's had composing for projects from Oliver Stone's Wall Street to Nickelodeon's Good Burger. Now, a quick word. Mr. Copeland squeezed this in as he was on his tour bus traveling, and we were actually having some bad weather here in the city, so sometimes the call might be a little bit hard to hear, but I promise it's nothing major, and it's kind of cool. We kind of surmised that that was the issue. So here now to talk about creating orchestrations we can rock to, our interview with Stuart Copeland. Stuart Copeland, welcome to the show today. How are you, sir? Very good, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm really, really excited about Off the Score this uh, Friday. It's such a mix of several really cool elements. What can everyone expect from the show? Um, well, it's pretty strange. It rocks, and yet it's very serious. We take uh, serious classical music and mess it up and kind of jazz it up. Well, I, I use that word advice, but not jazz it up. We kind of excite it and mess with it. <laughs> and we have a couple of really fancy classical players, John Kimura Parker. He's the kind of guy who parachutes in and plays rock four, you know, with the big orchestra. And he, but he doesn't normally improvise, which he does in this context. And also Yun Kwan from the Metropolitan Opera. We have very fancy players, but they're all kind of jumping off the cliff by being in a world of improvisation based on the classic material. That's really, really cool. Now, so everybody will be confused. <laughs> yeah, and how did you come up with this? Did you create this, uh, this, this show um, that you're going to present with John Kimura Parker? Uh, wh- what was the impetus for the idea? Well, John, uh, John Kimura Parker and I met, we call him Jackie. Jackie, uh, yeah. We met and had this idea, because he's been playing Stravinsky and all this big material, but he's always felt that, He'd love to get off the page to kind of take it and mess with it. But in the classical world, there's nobody for him to really collaborate with on such a mission that he could find. And he ended up with me. And I'm somebody who's had a life of rock and roll, but I really like working with those classical players. Because as a composer, I can put really complex stuff on the page, and only those guys can play it, which is why I'm sort of interested in that world, which is what brought Jackie and I together. And between us, we hatched this scheme to build this uh, this band that kind of uses the improvisation, the excitement that you get from that. Which, by the way, you know, people like me, we do it all the time. But for me to play with these classical guys jumping off the cliff into improvisation, which normally terrifies them, it's not, it actually adds an extra zing of excitement. Do you think they feel safe with you because of your background? Do you think that's part of why, why they do it? There's a safety net with you? Well, the, the part they enjoy is watching me maneuver through seven, eight time signatures and such, um, and dealing with Stravinsky and his capricious use of, use of compound meter and cha- you know, uh, changing time signatures. And so we're all kind of just outside of our comfort zone, which is what gives us a thrill. You know, these are folks who can go on stage in their normal world and completely sit down and command it, you know? Yeah. Um, but in this context, we're all kind of on the edge of our seat. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I want to talk about your background. Everybody knows you, uh, of course, from the police as the drummer. And you, of course, play drums expertly. Uh, I read starting at age 12. But I would imagine composing is, of course, a completely different set of skills. When did the bug to write music bite you and, and work on these complex compositions? 
I think that came first. I think it's more of a trait than a career decision. Um, and I think playing music, generally for most musicians, is that as well. It's, you know, you, it's somewhere you choose to become a professional artist of whatever kind, but really the choice was already made in your DNA. If you are a guitarist and you just got to, you know, you hear a guitar one day when you're four or ten or whatever age, and you just got to do it and you can't be stopped. In fact, it takes a kind of autism to get that good on a guitar, that you do that repetitive motion and lose this kind of activity. Um, so it's more of a trait. It is... It is so interesting to me that a, a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame member uh, turns to orchestral composition. Uh, what does the kind of composition you do and that we're going to see on Friday uh, do for you creatively that maybe rock and roll doesn't, does not permit? Well, we'll be playing Johnny B. Good, um, <laughs> nor rock, rock, Roxanne. Yes. But we will be playing Stravinsky, Ravel, Prokofiev, and others. Um, and about half the material is stuff of mine that I've written for various things in the past. Um, you know, kind of, it's, they call it classical because I have to work in a world that is called classical, even though I didn't die 200 years ago to be pedantic. But also, I'm not into classical music, I'm into music, you know, music that rocks. So my intention is to burn the house down, but I like those classical players, and I like those classical venues. I love classical orchestras. So I have to work in a world that is called classical, but it ain't classical. Right, right. And can you, Sorry, go ahead. It's complicated, but also what I'm trying to bring is what I've learned in decades in rock and roll, which is that it also must be simple. It's also got to, you know, to use an overused word, uh, it's got to rock. It's got to have a fundamental primal scream to it, a primal, a primal throb that you can get without thinking too hard about it. But also, having established that, then you can do cool and interesting stuff. You know, you, you, can, you, can, you can have your filigree, your, your complication on top of a solid bedrock. The solid bedrock could be Stravinsky, or it could be one of my ostinato bass lines. <laughs> Absolutely. And I would imagine your experience in percussion, uh, I'm not a music person, so a lot of these questions might sound repetitive or, or odd, but um, I, I would imagine that, that, that rock is a lot in the percussion, and, and the percussion has a lot to do with, with that feel that these unique compositions uh, have of yours. Really? They two different parts of the brain are working. And there are two almost unrelated tricks. You know, playing drums is one thing. That's animal, it's primal. I hear the drums, and I can on. And it goes back to when I was a skinny kid and late developer. <laughs> yeah, I remember us growing up and growing facial hair, and I was a little kid squeak, but man, I hit the drums, and I was King Kong. And so there's kind of a power that connects me to that. And even now, father of seven. Whereas composing is a completely different part of the brain. That's all pretty stuff. That's all intellectual, flying through the sky, textures, often orchestral textures, but, but raging guitar, too. Absolutely. But it's parts of the mind. Yes. Now, there is, I was, I was looking up some of your, your work last night uh, in, in preparation for this interview, as I do. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of yours. And I see that you have a YouTube channel um, that has yes, some, I do. some of your videos. YouTube is hotly contested in, in the world of music because of rights and everything. And I'm curious, with your experience, what, you, what your opinion of the medium is and, and why you like it. I think it's an excellent medium. And uh, the really good news about the world today in, in music is that anyone can do it these days. The threshold has been lowered. So you don't need to study. Um, and, you know, you don't need to go off into the woodshed and learn an instrument, you can make it on your laptop. So music has become more available to more people. You don't even need to have an instrument. You've got a com if you've got a computer, you can pull sounds together and create music. That's a wonderful thing. Anybody can do it. It means that a lot, the talent pool is a lot wider and that more great talents might emerge from a larger talent pool. problem is there's so many other musicians out there. How do you get heard? And that's where your question about YouTube comes in, which YouTube is one of those platforms where anybody can make a track or a little clip, put it up there, it's a free world. It's a good thing. 
the problem is making a living out of it has become much more challenging. And also, making, even if put making a living aside, making a mark and getting noticed amongst the, the hordes of other talented people, that's gotten a lot more challenging, too. So I don't know how you fix that problem, but the good news is for people who aren't in this business, there's a lot more music to choose from. And what do you say to the people who don't want their music on, on YouTube? That's the, that's, the, uh, that's the debate, is that, you know... Uh, the people who cannot put their music on YouTube, who are they? No, that don't want their music on YouTube. Artists that, that uh, kind of push back from it uh, because it, it takes money out of... because they say it takes money away from the creators. Well, I think that's kind of old school. Um, the new artists that I know of, they'll put their stuff up for free. In fact, the new paradigm is to give your music away for free so that you can sell the t-shirt. <laughs> right. And I don't see a problem with that, actually. Let the music be free. Let all the children hear the music. And if you like the music and you want to get involved with that artist, buy the t-shirt. No, I... Is, you know, yeah, I absolutely... I, I, I completely agree with you there. Is there anyone you're working with? Let's let's talk a little bit about the uh, the orchestra, the uh, the quintet that you're going to be working with on Friday. Is there anybody that you actually discovered their their work through an online medium, whether it's YouTube or maybe a submission? Anybody you discovered through this new technology? Well, yeah, um, too many to mention. Really, it's a great medium for finding things. Yeah. Um, so, for, for just surfing, and you know, you, you hear about something. Uh, Hungary. I'm going to visit Hungary. What's Hungarian music like? Hungary, YouTube, bang! You get, you're right there, and you can surf your way through all kinds of cool stuff, or whatever might strike your, you know, your you know, pique your interest. Absolutely, it's a wonderful thing. Absolutely. Now, um, I want the only pe- the only people who object to the YouTube thing are the old, guys even older than me, really <laughs> old school. Yeah. I'm kind of crappy about it. <laughs> yeah, I want to switch gears here. Speaking of, of different mediums, um, I have to ask about this because you have composed for so many great films and, and television series. You, uh, of course, did Wall Street. Um, but one I'm curious about, because I didn't know this, is that you've actually done some work for Schneider's Bakery and Nickelodeon. How did you come to work with uh, for The Amanda Show and uh, Good Burger? Well... Oddly, Good Burger has become kind of a cult classic. Yes, My it has. My 16-year-old daughter says, Dad, did, did you really do Good Burger? You know, she could never asked me about Wall Street. <laughs> um, and there's this a strange phenomenon. You know, some of my best work has been done in the service of commerce and when under really a lot of pressure. The strange thing happened. You know, when you do episodic TV, the show comes in Tuesday... You've got to deliver by Friday. There's got to be something on the tape, whether it's your finest hour or not. You have to deliver, period. And so you do, and you get into a thing. It kind of a momentum builds. And as you work faster and faster, the ideas come faster and faster. And actually, the quality of the ideas gets deeper and better. And so, like when I was doing the Equalizer or Dead Like Me, these episodic things, the new episode, some of my favorite themes, my deepest music came in a flash, while in a real big hurry to deliver something. And, you know, I did a game called Spiral of the Dragon. Um, and when I write big orchestral pieces, I'm tempted, well, I actually do, I go back into that cookie jar and pull out some of those three-note tricks that came to me when I was, you know, at a, at a sprint to deliver music. Absolutely. So it may seem that some things are, like, low-brow, and other things are highbrow. You know, the Pittsburgh uh, Symphony commissions me to write a concerto that's highbrow. Um, in my past, I've had to write the theme song for the Amanda Show, which actually I'm proud of both. Yeah, and uh, I, that's that's really cool. I, it's just your body of work is one of the most in- interesting bodies of work out there for exactly the reason you just outlined, and I can't wait to see what you do on Friday. So let's get back to the show, uh, and let's talk about this, uh, this group of musicians that you've put together. Uh, they are all, of course, musicians you're fond of. What do you look for when you're putting a group together? Well, uh, the main, you know, first of all, you look at people who are really talented. You check their work. You like it. It turns you on or not. But then there's something actually equally important, which is there are a lot of brilliant musicians that don't kind of click together, mm-hmm. that don't connect. And it's 
in the classical world, that's even more difficult because usually they don't think in those terms. They look at the music on the page and they lean into that. And they, they're devoted to really accurately representing what's on the page. They don't think in terms of using their ears and listening to the guy to their left and the guy to their right. So finding classical musicians who can do that was, uh, you know, we, we ended up finding the right people for that. Absolutely. It's really, it's really uh, the ability to read and kind of think with your ears as well as your eyes. Yes, absolutely. And what are you looking forward to this, uh, this weekend on Friday about coming back to New York specifically to perform the show? Well, I'm looking forward to coming back to Albany, where I played with the big orchestra there one time. Yeah. Um, I did a show there in Albany. Huh. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting back to that city. Very scenic city, actually. Yes, yes. And, uh, but we're, uh... and now, of course, at the show, it's going to be amazing. We're all going to take our clothes off and <laughs> dance through the streets afterwards, <laughs> driven to a frenzy by this incredible music. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, and there's something about the downtown audiences here in, uh, in Manhattan that are just, the mix works, I think, because you get the people that, are classic, that love classical but also love the rock side of you. Well, I hope that those, that, that's two kind of far extremes, but that, there's a lot of people who like both. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It generally works pretty well. I mean, it, it's sort of like, what is this going to be? But I think people pick up on what it is pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited at doing some so reading. So far, so good anyway. <laughs> so far, so good. Yes. Now, I know you got to go. I know you're busy and you're on the bus, uh, but I never let my guests escape without this final question. Uh, we, are, we are a college. We, are, uh, we do have a lot of students that study music here. What's one piece of advice that you have for anybody, drummers, composers, and musicians in general, that want to get into the profession? Um, one piece of advice. Dang, there's so many pieces of advice. Um, for the general musician uh, who's interested in music, I would say get on the mic, because so much popular music comes from the song, and the person singing the song kind of runs the show. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're a guitarist, you know, I, I think it's figure out how to make music for yourself and do as much of it yourself, but do it is the main thing. And um, if you are a procrastinator, put that behind you, leap forward, start the mission, pick up the phone, pick up your instrument, and just do it. Absolutely, just do it. And I cannot wait to see what you do, what you do this Friday at the Schimmel Center. Thank you so much, Mr. Stuart Copeland. This was an honor. Thank you. Well, thank you. Mr. Stuart Copeland, I cannot wait to see you on Friday night. Again, tickets are available at Mr. Copeland's website. Students at Pace University should go to the Schimmel Center box office to purchase them in person for $10. But everybody should hurry because they are going really fast. That's it for us this week. Thank you again to our season sponsors, Axtel Expressions and the Tangent Bound Network. Stay tuned to talkfor2.com on Twitter and Facebook for more. Reach out by emailing talkfor2cast at gmail.com and talk about us uh, using the hashtag talkfor2. Oh, and real quick, we have a new Instagram. That's talkfor2pod, P-O-D. Uh, that's at. That's also an at, just like Twitter. It's talkfor2pod. We are on Instagram officially, I have succumbed. Signing off for Talk for Two, I'm Matt Bailey, reminding everyone out there to keep talking for two. You can hear more show business interviews with the stars at talkfor2.com. <laughs>